Well, good evening, everybody. And once again, thank you for tuning in to this week's Hocus Focus. My name is Thomas Sheridan. And I'm Sarah Mondaini. And we're back with our weekly dive into the world of Fortiana with a sprinkling of hauntology in order to give you the things that make life worth living because in this increasingly strange age, it makes more sense than what's presented to us on the evening news or in the newspapers. I hope you're well, Sarah, and uh, things have improved weather-wise for you over there. It's been a good week. The sunshine's been trying. It's even managed to come out for a little while, managed to sit out in the garden before it went freezing cold and wet and rainy again. But apart from the unpredictable weather, it's not been a bad week at all. Yourself? Yeah, the same. It's moving in the right direction, but by Lord, is it very, very slowly. Uh, thanks, everyone, for your responses, as always, to last week's show. And um, we're really looking forward to another Sunday evening of high strangeness with you all. And let's kick the high strangeness right off with our first story tonight. And you like this one. And I didn't know an awful lot about this until Sarah suggested it. But it is the story of the big grey man in Scotland on Fjar Lat Muir, to say it in Gaelic. Now, uh, literally means the big, the big gray man or the tall gray man, but um, it's an interesting one. This one, a mixture of a cryptid, very strange thing altogether. Uh, we get both sight and sound with this one, and what makes the story of the big gray man uh, very interesting is the absolutely deep and terrifying effect it had on the witnesses. Now, in the Cairngorm Mountains of Scotland, which is the highest mountain range, I believe, in either the UK or Ireland, there is a mountain called the Ben Macdee, and it's the second highest mountain after Ben Nevis in Great Britain. It's a, a rocky, gravelly mountaintop, hence the term. That's why they're called Cairngorms. The mountain's made of rubble of millions and millions of years old. On this mountain, when the weather seems to deteriorate, people report seeing a 10-foot, dark-skinned, large shoulders a entity. I couldn't even, it's humanoid in shape and look, but its proportions are all wrong. It's much too tall. Uh, much too thin, and his shoulders are much too wide. And it's usually heard before it's seen. Its footsteps are heard crunching in the damp. It's constantly damp up there, nearly always. The damp, gravelly surface of the summit and the sides of the mountain. The first reported event of the Big Grey Man was in, no, the first official now, was in 1925 when none less than a professor and a big shot with the National Geographic Society claims to have heard and seen the thing, and it left the man petrified to the point where he said he would never go on that mountain ever again. He said the thing was stalking and following him, and every time he took a few footsteps, it would follow behind him. Now, we're not talking about your typical 40 and witness that's branded about in the media. Generally, it'll be some farmer or poor person or an average person. And they'll say, well, this person doesn't know anything about science or nature or anything like that. So, you know, he could, he could have mistaken it for anything. No, this gentleman was as high up in science as you could get. A professor and a head of the National Geographic Society. And he was well aware of what animals were and what nature is that he was not an uneducated peasant who mistook something for this entity also the effect it had on him is constantly reported in the, the main cases have all been reported by serious people you know military people educated people and not you know drovers you know losing they lost their sheep on the mountain or anything like that although they have been reported the sightings and it's always the same. The footsteps in the gravel, the sighting of this tall creature with wide shoulders and dark grayish skin, 
or blackish skin, and the absolute sense of terror, including a point where someone had to fire a revolver at it once. Now, and all came away saying, it's the big grey man. And after this 1925 report, earlier reports by people who had seen it, who finally had the bravery to come forward, were released as far back as 1904, and talking up their encounters with the big grey man. The sceptics have put forward possibly the most ridiculous rationale to explain it. They're claiming it's the Brocken Spectre. Now, the Brocken Spectre is a atmospheric phenomena that was first really made a big deal of in the Brocken Mountains in northern Germany, Mount Brocken in the Hartz Mountains in northern Germany. And it's synonymous with witchcraft and things like that. It's actually a atmospheric effect caused by an extremely bright sunlight. And I know people have experienced in the mountains here in Ireland, extremely bright sunlight behind you, casting a shadow on water vapor or ice crystals in a, in a light fog. And the impression is you see a giant figure of a human. And there was even, you know, there was even, these were even reported on this mountain going back to the 1700s and people would realize it wasn't the giant because they'd moved their arms and the shadow would move its arms. One guy took his cap off and realized it was himself casting, casting this uh, atmospheric effect. This is nonsense. Firstly, many of the reports of the big gray man took place in poor weather, no sunshine. So you did not have that bright light. Secondly, a Brock inspector does not make footsteps. And thirdly, People who've seen a Brock inspector are usually the same as they see a, a sun dog or one of those solar effects. They're amazed and enchanted by it. They find it a uh, very, very almost beautiful. It's such a beautiful thing to see. No Brock inspector has left the person, let alone a professor at the, at the big shot of the National Geographic Society, terrified of going near the mountain ever again. Now we leave the speculation to the discussion. So what do you think of the big grey man, Sarah? Well, I was thinking, could it possibly be the actual spirit of the mountain or the mist that resides up there? Because mountains are, are high up and they're seen as sacred and powerful places, almost like a link between heaven and earth, a place where spirits and gods dwell. So... Perhaps the big grey man is a spirit or entity that inhabits the mountain environment and is connected to the natural forces that shape it. And air represents spirit. So is the big grey man a supernatural entity that could be gaseous in nature or only partly visible as a misty spectre? Because it's not of this physical world. It might be that the entity is able to manipulate the air and use it as a means of appearing and disappearing which would be one way to explain why the sightings of it are often very fleeting and there's a whole world of well is there a whole world of air spirits just as there's nature spirits in the woods that adapt to the surroundings and they take on the characteristics do air spirits live around the mountains and take on the characteristics of the air and the extreme weather patterns that are up there in the area? So it could be an entity that's adapted to the mountain environment and takes on the form of a humanoid figure shrouded in this mountain mist and shadow. It's the thing is that it, it does tie in with a lot of folklore in Celtic, in Celtic mythology. And what you said about the spirit of the mountain made manifest is actually quite common in things like Hinduism. Like people will say they saw Hindu gods and a mountain that was sacred to them and so on. You know, people in places like that were in woodlands and groves devoted to the goddess Diana or Artemis claim to have seen Diana or Artemis in the wood, like as an actual person, well, appearing as a person. And that's a very interesting idea, and uh, it's it's something that really I would go with, except that it seems to be like the Bigfoot thing in America, come out of another dimension and affect this one physically. The, the footsteps and the gravel, to me, would suggest it has 
it has you know substance it's it's it has a force upon the local environment which doesn't discount the thing that's not what you said because it literally could come alive as a being as a as a, a living thing especially if it's interdimensional it's there all the time but only certain conditions do you see it and it does it see us when this when the veil is thinned or something whatever like those they use that kind of expression there is a character in Celtic folklore and that part of Scotland, you know, that's why they speak Irish, is, is all part of that as well. The area was sacred, it was very sacred to the Druids at the, during the Celtic times. And that's why a lot of places are named after oaks and, you know, they have the name Derry, not Derry, which is Druid, which is Druid, wood, oak, wood, no, oak, oak forest. So, yeah, that could be it. Now, in the big in the Grey Man tradition of Celtic mythology, this 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 fairy like creature wanders the dangerous coastlines and the mountain woodlands, and it takes on a different shape. Generally, it's a grey man, and a straggly figure, kind of very similar to how Odin or Gandalf is, was described. Uh, a long cloak, a staff. And generally a trickster, but not a very nice one, a dangerous one. For instance, its association with rocky, rocky and rugged coastlines, it, it causes, it creates a, a mist here, the mist, the mist thing, and leads uh, ships to their doom to be crashed onto the rocks, killing mariners. Now, this thing, how do we know people who had terrible falls in the Cairngorms did not see? the big grey man before they met their doom like he tricked them to walk off a cliff or he tricked them to walk on unstable ground because this thing has an obvious sense of terror surrounding it for a reason for someone to pull a revolver on it and fire at it and for educated people to say they'd never go on that mountain ever again it left them so terrorized i think just because of that this is one of the most plausible cryptid entity stories i think i've ever heard yeah, it is an, um, an ancient Celtic landscape up there. And I was thinking along the same lines as you, but more that it was perhaps not something that was there to cause harm, but perhaps a guardian of the ancient, of that ancient landscape because it's not uncommon for folklore to attribute guardianship roles to certain entities or spirits that are believed to reside in natural environments like that. So I thought that, Possibly in this case, the big grey man could be seen as a protector of the mountains, maybe in, ensuring that those who visit or live in the area do so with respect and caution. Or just stay away. I mean, it could be like a cobra. A cobra will flare up before it strikes, but it rarely strikes. Most people who've been bitten by a cobra have accidentally stood on his tail or have, you know, deliberately put themselves in danger. Or just thought, you know, they're just it's just bad luck. But the cobra will do everything not to attack you. It will just it, it literally just warns you. It's you know, it it will frighten you away that way. And uh because it's terrif it's the cobra the king cobra is as terrified of you as you are the king cobra. And that's could we we can't rule that out here either. That this thing is also frightened of us. And there's a kind of a predator prey dynamic going on that we feel and perhaps it feels at the very basic sensory level. Because these men clearly felt they were in danger. That's interesting, actually, because if you consider the psychological effects of the extreme environments, such as the high altitudes and isolation, it's possible that prolonged exposure to such conditions can heighten a person's anxieties and moods, and that might contribute to the manifestation of certain supernatural entities like that fear and anxiety that you get that's associated with with extreme environments could potentially manifest itself oh, as a big great I, man I, in that it in that it represents dangers and uncertainties of the mountain. Now the skeptic of the debunker would say, and this causes them to have hallucinations or you know see things as what they're not but that's that's what an npc does you know a person has a depth of soul 
you look, we've all been in situations where we have generated Fortean phenomena or effects around us when we were frightened. It happened to me as a child. A wardrobe lifted up in the air and and fell on my bed because I, I thought there was a monster inside the, the wardrobe. Whether it was catalytic exteriorization phenomena or I was even generating a minor uh, little grey man in my wardrobe, it, 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 it still happened. The terror, you know, yeah, this, it's a terror and hallucination is one thing, but terror and physical sensory perception of the thing is a different thing altogether. So I'd be down with that one. I, and also the mountain doesn't, the, the mountain may want to be left alone. You see, one of the problems with Western, well, I'd say post-Christian Westerners, that the, the concept of a sacred space in nature to be not to be not to be left alone for the spirits or the gods or the ancestors or the fairies to have exclusive domain over has been lost. That's why so many in this part of the world they've gone living underground in mines and everything else, very similar to the jinn. So in the olden days, that thing was don't go up that mountain because that's where so and so lives on Fjarlat Moor, right? And you have that all over the world. You in the pagan times, entire woodlands just be set aside for goddess and goddesses like Sintra in Portugal. That woodland was set aside for Diana. Uh, Sintra is another name for Cynthia, which is also Diana, uh, Artemis. And this was common all over the world. The woodlands would be left alone in the Roman world for Pan. And don't go in there. That's not your, that's forbidden to mortals. The Cairngorms on that particular mountain could be that. Yeah. Yeah, because um, I was thinking the with the anxiety and the psychological aspects, I, wa I was thinking more on the lines of it creating psychic pockets for these things to manifest themselves, not not that they were imagining it, you know. The more, now that we're talking about it, the more I think about your idea of the mountain made manifest, I'm really getting certain of, that's, that's it. You know when you hear something and you feel it, you know, and I'm starting to think, yeah, you know, you're onto something there and I think that could be it. So I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna go with your theory that it is the, the the living spirit of the mountain, the soul embodiment of the mountain. That's probably true. Previous veneration and even fear has been can manifest itself as a living flesh and blood creature, and this is what I'd say it probably is. I think I'm gonna go with that for now. It's not an hallucination. Hallucinations don't make noises. Hallucinations don't affect people that badly. And, and it's certainly possible that there's creatures or beings that we're not aware of that reside on the tops of mountains. In fact, there's, there's so much of the world that's still largely unexplored and could potentially have undiscovered species or entities. And many cultures and traditions have stories of these myth mythical beings or gods residing on mountaintops. And that suggests that there may be something more to these areas than we currently understand. There's a channel on YouTube where a guy in America explores mines, uh, all, all abandoned coal tin copper mines all over the US. And some of the stuff that he's photographed and recorded down in some of these mines, it's 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 terrifying. And it's not a it's not a 14 or paranormal channel, it's purely just a, a, a channel devoted with you know m the mining industry heritage and stuff, or industrial archaeology as they call it. But he has recorded so many strange things that would put the willies right up yet. When he'd be, and he would report saying that like the temperature suddenly changed in that part of the mine and so on. So there you go. I mean, they, 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 there's things out there who want to be left alone by, you know, want, don't want humans near them. They want them just like the when I was in Sri Lanka, a game warden said, if you walk off the path and you do see a cobra, they're everywhere. Just, just, just you know, gingerly walk away from the thing. Don't freak out or run or try to run towards it or just gingerly walk away because it'll leave you alone. And there you go, because that was the cobra's little bit of little patch of of jungle. Well, the great you know, the, the, the big grey man has his little patch of mountain. That's the same dynamic at work. Just like the Fay and the She have their own patches of woodland that they don't want us going around. And hawthorn so trees, yeah. Could it be the equivalent of the fairies of the mountain? Exactly, a fairy tree. Instead of a fairy tree, a fairy mountain. Absolutely, 100%. And all over Ireland, there's, there's places called Glenshee, 
the Canada Ferries, you know, you know, all the, the sec, you know, they're all remote areas. I mean, Glenshee, the, the Glenshee and Donegal is a very remote area. And it's like, yeah, the ferries live there. There's a place called the Poison Glen where the ferries poison the water supply to stop anyone from living in there. And in, I think it was like during, during the Irish War of Independence, a whole bunch of British troops died there after drinking the water of a spring. And so, you know, there are parts of the world that we humans are not supposed to be. We're going into there, you know, we've, we've robbed them of, see, this could be back to Antarctica again. You wonder if Antarctica has all these, if they all meant to Antarctica, you know, this kind of thing. Or somewhere like that. But look at all the deaths on top of Mount Everest. Have you ever seen the amount of bodies on Mount Everest? It's a gigantic cemetery. I mean, thousands are killed on it. All kinds of idiots go climbing and they are, they're all killed. And uh, it's extremely dangerous. And Everest is a giant mountain. And Everest is a sacred mountain to the Hindus and the Buddhists. Yes, that makes sense. That there might be something up there that doesn't want you snooping around up there, just like what Lovecraft said with um, in his stories. There are places and areas that you're not, that we're not meant to go on this earth. And and I think Edmund, it was Edmund Hillary. On remember that the the Arthur C. Clarke Mysterious World that show we grew up with as kids, he meant did a special on the Yeti, and I think he was still alive. Edmund Hillary, the New Zealand uh, mountaineer who conquered Everest. And he said, there was a, a shadow of doubt that Yeti was real. And they saw the Yeti and they saw its footsteps. So people think, well, Yeti's a, a Bigfoot, you know, type thing in, in Asia. But Yeti could be the spirit of Everest and that part of the Himalayas. And I'm sure the native people that live in Nepal would probably come out and say, yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, I like that. The spirit of the mountain, you know, it, it's a big six seven eight foot tall humanoid because a mountain is a very tall tall thing so you would expect its representation to be tall and quite overpowering and overwhelming well bigfoot is big this guy is big gray man yet he is, terrifies people with its, its loud scream it's it's the course it's, it's this sort of there has to be a word for like bio spiritual or you know Crypto spiritual, a new term needs to be developed for these kinds of things, uh, and that's this is it's their equivalent of the cobra flaring up. Get off my land! Yeah, yeah. So that was the big gray man. Uh, funny enough, a a paranormal Freudian story that doesn't get the level of attention that it should, probably because it's impossible to debunk, and the witnesses are too credible. And the debunkers prefer to pull out things like they can easily debunk and they stay away from things they can't. But if you have any theories on the big grey man, you're part of the show too and let it rip in the comments. Thanks very much. And in this week's Folk Horror Cinema, we look at the 1996 Hammer, we love Hammer films here on Hocus Focus, movie of The Reptiles, starring Jacqueline Pierce and Noel William, and as usual, the incredible Michael Ripper, a Hammer mainstay actor, who gets to actually play a great role in this, and he, he really shines as an actor. The story takes place in Victorian Cornwall, where at the beginning of the movie, a gentleman who's living down there shows up with this poisonous substance coming out of his mouth, his face all black, and he dies of what they call the Black Debt. This character comes along after he's been buried and puts a, a, a wreath on his grave, and he seems to do this to all the victims. And his name is Dr. Franklin, and he's a mysterious kind of a professorial type who lives in the village, but keeps separate from them. He doesn't really go hang around them. He lives separately with his daughter, Anna, in the local manor house. The brother and the newly wedded sister-in-law of the man who dies at the beginning, 
this inherited a cottage in the Cornish town and decided to go live in this village. And as soon as they arrive, it's they get the kind of like we don't like strangers much around here kind of uh, thing. And Michael Ripper, who plays once again the innkeeper or bar pub owner, is the only one who's particularly nice to them. And uh, he also pol more politely says, you won't find happiness here. This is not a happy town. People mysteriously die. Now, they, the, the young couple make, a, make friends with a local homeless person or local character called Mad Peter. And Mad Peter is basically who they use to get the insight on the community. And he tells them there's something very evil and wicked going on this, in this village. Sadly, Michael Peter is then bitten by this woman who has a face like a lizard or something. And we're introduced to what the story is about. The story is about a professor of theology or a doctor of theology, we discover, who had spent many years living in Asia studying divinity and theology, local customs, and had come back to Cornwall with his daughter, Anna played by Jacqueline Pierce. You'll remember her as Serverland when she was much older in Lake 7. And not only is she beautiful, but she's sweet and lovely. And she wants to make friends with the family that moved in. And her father thinks adores her and thinks the world of her, but he acts very strange around her. Turns out that while they were in the tropics, they were cursed by a kind of a Hindu witch doctor who brought, came, but they brought the, one of the leaders of the cult Called just known as the Malay, in the in the title of the in the script of the film, back to Cornwall, and they're they're living over a hot spring, a natural sulfur hot spring that the house is built upon, and it's very hot for the purpose of keeping Anna, who's a shape shifting reptile, because of this curse that she got in the tropics, and she's the one turning into a kind of a snake let reptile lady, and going around biting everyone. She's no control over it. And it's very interesting because her personality is so lovely and sweet and she's everything, a perfect daughter. You then you suddenly realize that Franklin is not is got is not a bad guy. He's his heart is absolutely broken and he's a prisoner of this uh this cult from Malaysia and Java with that basically are now destroying his life and ruining him and ruining his daughter. It culminates with the usual showdown. They give Michael Ripper a real role in this film. That he takes instead of just being like the barkeep who says, you know, you you please leave, sir. He's more he's more actively involved in the in the story, and, and it culminates in basically the destruction of the the whole family unit surrounding the the Anna and the horse are placed upon them with uh, the young couple and Michael Ripper, the barman, surviving. So. What strikes me about this film is it's very, very sad. It's really about how the a man's unconditional love for his daughter, who he adores, has been turned into dark madness by the witchcraft of the East that he's been him and her are subject to. And that's how I see the film. I thought the cast of the, the couple who played the main people that arrived in the village, I didn't think they were particularly well cast. They, they didn't convince me. That's the, the film's biggest letdown, and it has a kind of a cheesy special effects element to it. It's basically, you know, a woman with a, a snake head on her mask. But it still works. It, 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 it gets you here. The film definitely is one of those kind of horror films that gets you, hammer films that gets you here. And uh, it's just a story of tragedy and also a kind of a warning of for Westerners, and I've been saying this to you a lot for years now. The occult that's not, and I remember he didn't say he was in India, he said he was in Java and Sumatra, so he, was, he wasn't part of the Indo European world. That the occult and the magic traditions of groups who are not Indo European are very risky and dangerous things for us to come into con close contact with because we do not have the psychic or spiritual defense systems built into us because of our ethnicity to res to protect ourselves from them. So I think this is a, that's a kind of like a message I took from The Reptile. 1966, Hammer movie, very good film, uh, lovely colors. The, the copy 
About 20 years ago, Hammer released all their films on DVDs, but they didn't remaster most of them, and there's no extras on the DVD. So the print copy I got has still a lot of grainy problems on it and some uh, the occasional hair in the gate pops up. So it's not like a, a beautiful restoration. But, you know, that kind of adds it to it because it kind of adds to the effect that you're watching an old film in, in a dingy cinema. But uh, The Reptile, 1966 Hammer movie, Directed by, I believe the guy's name was John Gilman, I think it was. But that's 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 the film this week. What did you think of it, Sarah? I liked um I liked it. I liked the gothic and supernatural feel to it with it being set in the Victorian time and I like the dress and everything. And it all added to this um sense of spookiness where the the boundaries between the real world and the liminal are really blurred. Like, for instance, the newlyweds move into a cosy, idyllic-looking cottage where she's focused on making the house um, a home and she serves up eggs and bacon to visitors and she always makes sure it looked warm and inviting. But beyond the threshold of this house is this village plagued by death and everyone is looked upon as being guilty because none of the villagers actually know what's going on. So there was this new home life, new married life that was all about to be shattered with what was actually going on in the village. And yes, it was produced by Hammer Film Productions and it's we know it's a studio known for its massive output of horror films during the 60s and 70s. And one of my favourite things about the Hammer films is the use of colour, which I think is perfect for the horror film genre of that time because the audiences then wanted something more visually striking than the old black and white films that they'd been used to or that they see at home, especially if they've got, they go to see the Hammer films at the cinema. And the film, I found some hauntological significance in there. And for me, it lay in the idea of a curse where... A curse is like a reoccurring theme in lots of horror films. And I always see it to be a metaphor for a fear of the past's ability to haunt the present. So, for example, in the film, this snake curse actually takes on a physical form. And it was put on the daughter by an ancient snake cult after they kidnapped her. And when she arrived back home to this sleepy seaside town in Cornwall... And the transformation starts. I saw it as perhaps a metaphor for the way in which the past, what's happened in the past, can shape and influence the present, even if we try to escape it and ignore it. And another significant part that I, I found in there was the part where the venom from the snake was causing people to die from what they said was heart failure even though there were two great big massive puncture marks on the backs of people's necks, it was still being put down to the Black Death. And these puncture marks were all but ignored as being the true cause of these people dying. And again, it all sounds a bit familiar to what we're seeing now. And I did wonder if this film is another case of the writers inadvertently tapping into a future timeline or a, another form of cut-up magic where you can divinate by using bits of this and bits of that to create stories and art so on the surface it's a somewhat cheesy film but classic horror film but when you watch it again in retrospect when you're a bit older and with a different understanding of the world and with a hauntological eye you see a lot of significances and things that could be seen as metaphoric for things that are much deeper then you you first realize, and I don't think that's accidental or happenstance. It's like the whole ontological world we grew up in was almost like a seed that was planted in our, our our subconscious mind back in the day, to only come into manifestation now, and to it helps it helped us do things like avoid the rona. Uh, quick tidbit: a friend of mine used to be back in New York was the editor of Fangoria magazine which was the world's number one horror movie magazine. And he told me a tidbit about the Hammer Colour. Apparently they bought hundreds of rolls of Eastman film that from Kodak that 
it, it, Kodak believed were chemically the chemical mixture was wrong on it. And when they developed the film, there was nothing wrong with the film in terms of recording images, but it had an oversaturation of the film emulsion, so the colors were richer. And Hammer actually has deeply colored films, especially with the reds, because of this over emulsified Kodak film. I don't know how true that is, but he told me that's what he heard, and when he was in the know. But uh, yeah, the reptile definitely worked, it. and as like Sarah said, you'll take all different kinds of things from it. And next week's folk horror cinema review, and I know some of you have been waiting for this one for a while, is The Devil Rides Out with Christopher Lee, based on the Dennis Wheatley novel, A Tale of Witchcraft, Black Magic, Intrigue, among the English home counties, and that immortal lion, the goat of Mendes, the devil himself. So get watching The Devil Rides Out, and we'll review that next week. If you haven't seen it, you're in for a treat. Our next topic tonight took place on the 20th of January, 1996. And authorities in Virginia, Brazil, received reports from people who had witnessed a creature that had defied explanation. The sightings bore a resemblance to those that had taken place with the Dover Demon in Massachusetts during the 70s. But the creature sighting in Brazil became known as the Virginia Devil and also the Virginia Extraterrestrial. And as news of the sighting spread, some believe it to be a sign of impending doom, while other people saw it as evidence of life beyond this planet. And as the investigation into the creature's origins continued, experts from a wide range of fields were called in to help to try and unravel the mystery. Now, two women were the first to report seeing it. And at first, they thought it was an injured animal, like a cat. And they approached it with concern and compassion. But as they drew closer, they soon realised that it was no ordinary creature, nor was it a human being. They claimed its head was oversized and its eyes glowed like two fiery red orbs in the darkness. And despite their initial urge to help the creature, they soon realised it wasn't an animal and they thought it was the devil. And it's interesting to note that these two ladies were very religious. So could this be another case of a supernatural creature showing itself in accordance with the mindset of the ladies who experienced it? In the days leading up to this first sighting, locals had reported seeing UFOs as well as a cigar-shaped object that crashed to the ground. But then something even stranger began to happen. Numerous reports of unknown creatures started coming in, with many people claiming to have seen them roaming around the city. And as the sightings increased, so did the military, the police and the government presence in the area. Odd occurrences such as unexplained animal deaths and even the death of a military officer who'd been said to have handled one of the creatures started to happen and the officer got an infection and he subsequently died at only 23 years old. Now, despite all the evidence and eyewitness accounts, an official inquiry was launched in 2010 to investigate these strange events that had occurred in 1996. And what was their conclusion? Well, you might ask, get ready for this because it's a corker. They concluded that the creature in question was actually a homeless man named Modinho, who was probably dirty from the heavy rains and had stopped to crouch down by the wall. Yep, you heard that right. It was a homeless man, the whole thing. The inquiry dismissed all claims of cryptids, aliens or phantoms and insisted that the sightings were simply a case of mistaken identity on the part of the three women who had mistaken the homeless man for a spaceman. How careless of them, right? But that's not all. The inquiry also brushed off the heavy military truck presence in the area, claiming that they were there just carrying out routine duties. And it seems like they were determined to explain away any strange occurrences and put the whole thing to rest as quietly as possible. But for those people who experienced the sightings firsthand, their accounts can't be dismissed so easily. 
And in the central park of Virginia, there stands a saucer-shaped water tower, which serves as a reminder of the infamous UFO incident. And water seems to be a reoccurring element in these types of sightings. And while this time it wasn't a physical manifestation, it was still a symbolic presence. The events that took place in Virginia have been compared to the Roswell incident in the United States, with claims that a crashed craft was found and that it was carrying beings. And in, that, in 2022, a documentary filmmaker named James Fox released a film called Moment of Contact, the Roswell of Brazil, which explored the incident in great detail. In 1996, the people of Virginia, Brazil, witnessed a UFO event that would change their lives forever. Só que ele pleinava e aterrando lentamente a altitude ia caminhando. Call it another Roswell, if you will. It is a crashed vehicle that had beings on board. Mas que eles não poderiam admitir a verdade a população ia entrar em colapso. Nada temos a esconder. Finally, the facts will be revealed. The Virginia case is considered the most well-kept secret in the military circles of Brazil. My objective here is to put some clarity on what took place in Virginia, Brazil, January 1996. Dois seres extraterrestres foram capturados e depois posteriormente foram levados para o hospital. The witnesses are some of the most compelling testimony I've ever heard. Meu nome é Carlos de Souza. Meu nome é Cátia Xavier. Meu nome é Liliane Silva. Meu nome é Valkyria Silva. Em 1996, eu vi uma criatura estranha ali. Action! A lot of people in this town have a little piece of the puzzle. Naquele local, eu vi o rastro da criatura, o pé. Foi onde ele falou que o que eu vi era uma coisa sobrenatural. This year, Mark Bilicherez, he had captured this creature with his bare hands. Você confirma que o seu irmão estava de serviço naquele dia 20? Confirmo. After he captured the creature, he developed this infection that wouldn't go away. Foi pro CTI de manhã, 7 horas da manhã, 15 para o meio dia, ele veio a óbito. This can no longer be covered up. They might shoot us because we're on the property. <laughs> This can't be denied. Bateram na porta. E aí isso lá para mim. Fica quieto. Se qualquer um que ia sofrer uma punição muito severa. This was proof. We pulled this off. It'll be the most compelling testimony revealed. Of contact. Aqui, ó. Foi aqui. This is a level of confirmation that only a handful of people on this planet have. And during the making of this documentary, Fox interviewed a military intelligence officer who allegedly threatened to kill him on camera when questioned about the ET sightings. Unfortunately, Fox was unaware of this at the time because the man was speaking in Portuguese and his translator didn't relay the threat to him. All of the witnesses to the UFO event back in 1996 and the creature sightings all claim to have been threatened and are afraid to speak out about what they saw. And James Fox, the filmmaker, has since stated on camera that he's fearful of returning to Brazil after making the documentary. So what do you make of all that? I saw this covered on Joe Rogan a while back and it came across as very authentic and very plausible. Normally, I'm very sceptical of any kind of UFO stuff involving the military such as Roswell and Wendell's from Forest in England, um, almost completely uh, agreement that they're all psyops. They're either to cover black ops projects and nothing nothing paranormal happened there. And, and I often find it amazing and annoying that otherwise UFO, UFOologists who distrust the government suddenly automatically a trust authority when it comes from the highest rank in the military. But this one in Brazil is very different than Roswell or Wendelson Forest in England. It's because of the 
you get the impression the military was genuinely rattled by it. And uh, the fact the the fact that they said it was a homeless person, a tramp all covered in mud, shows a kind of a nervous breakdown was going on behind the scenes. Like that was they were in a panic to try and come up with anything to cover the story. And they invented this ridiculous, absurd one. That's usually usually someone like a policeman will tell you they're interrogating somebody who's guilty. They will make up the most convoluted and stupid excuse as an alibi. And that is the most convoluted where like an if they're really, you know, the, the truth is direct. Convolution and and absurdity is the mark of a liar. And this was um, this is convoluted and absurd. Their their rationale for it. So uh, the military, well, as is the U.S., Russian, and every other French and all the others, the British military, they don't know what the UFOs are. They're terrified by them too. They're they're messed with their heads as well, and they they haven't got a clue what they are either. You know, and uh, this whole thing that they're in contact with these beings and stuff. There's, there's, that's all. That's all a psyop as well. They, they, this, these things have no interest in them. And it's funny how you said about the water. That ties back with our first story, the, the big grey man, because he was water vapor, mist. So there you go, another one to do with the water. Yeah, I mean, this this is a great one. This is, a, I think, the most plausible UFO story I've heard to date in terms of a big, a big event. The military, lots of people seeing it. But especially how the the Brazilian military were like, shut up to the point that they shoot someone. The documentary, the filmmaker uh, James Fox, he's convinced it happened. Um, he spoke to numerous military personnel, and one of them took him to one side. He said and warned him you know you need to go home and stop this because you're going to put yourself in danger and James said to him off camera did it happen and the military man said he was quite a high up military man said oh yeah it happened and he looked like he was very afraid and uh, he looked him in the eye and he said this man wasn't lying this wasn't um, a man who was telling lies he was telling the truth he said, so I do believe it, it actually happened. And when I was reading about it, I got images from the, the movie Mars Attacks, you know, just pure pandemonium must have been going on in that city because these things were seen all over the place, apparently, in hospitals, um, around the supermarkets, everywhere. Really? Yeah. Like in broad daylight? Yes. They, some had turned up in the hospital. Describe their physical look again for us. Uh, they were um, small, like goblin-like, with big heads and um, orange eyes. Over demon again. Yeah. Oh. I will. What I'll do is I'll put a link to. It's difficult to put links on the comments in YouTube unless it's other YouTube videos. Because if you do that, YouTube removes the comment. But what I'll do in the description is I'll put the link to the interview with James Fox about him making that documentary so people can have a look and then they can find his movie from there. Right, this, this is going out on my channel, this one, right? So uh, I'll Oh, put, yes, so you do that, yeah. I'll, I'll send you the link. In the description box, I'll do that. And I, I found the way of putting links in the YouTube comments, but you have to kind of do a little Cody thing. But you can get away with it, but it's tricky. But I, I, I'll, I'll, so I'll put in the comments as well. Yes. Uh, what are your theories on this one? I'd like to hear that because I, I'm stumped. I don't know. I mean, they they said there was a cigar shaped craft had crashed. I don't. I don't know whether it's extraterrestrial or whether it's demon or. Uh, or a fairy, I really don't know with this one. It actually did put the wind up me a little bit reading about it because... Well, what's the cigar-shaped craft all about? I often found that one strange. I, I remember years ago, it wasn't in Fortean magazine, it was in some other paranormal magazine. It might have been fate that I read a letter that someone wrote in that the, the, the appearance of the cigar-shaped objects appeared mainly in the southern states of the United States during the civil rights era 
when Jim Crow was being abolished and all this stuff as Martin Luther King was going on. And it was a psychosexual projection of a black man's phallus that racists were seeing in the sky as a manifestation of their fear of what would happen if they, you know, if they lost their power over it. They gave, you know, they 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 were able, they took the civil they gave the civil rights to to black people. I found that one kind of very interesting, but this thing has appeared all over the world ever since. But uh, I, I just, I often, why a black, why is it, they always say black cigar shape. Why not black tube? Why not black lion? It's always, they're so specific about that shape. I often find there's lots of things shaped like a, a cigar. Why that? You know, I've always found that a weird one. It, that that could have been if there was something going on there, which I'm I, I'm in no doubt that there wasn't. I think really do think something was going on there, and the mil there was a high military presence there. Then that thing they saw in the sky that crashed that could have been some kind of stealth, um, um, okay. aircraft from the Brazilian army or something, so it could get an aerial view, something that we don't know about that that's come down. Yeah, or or showed up. You know, you never know if NASA or the American military, like the Navy, has special satellites that can actually detect these fourteen hotspots around the world, and they can. This thing shows up on a satellite or something. They get there right there before anyone. That actually apparently happened here in Ireland in the nineteen nineties. I keep wanting to get up to do a, a report on it, but there was something fell from the sky in the mountains nearby here. And the locals will tell you that there was a U.S. military personnel there before anyone else got there, and then they vanished really quickly. They suddenly swarmed on the area, which is, would have been actually been, because Ireland's not in NATO, would have been a violation of, it would have been like literally an act of war to do that, put U.S. personnel on Irish soil, unless they got permission, which they probably did, uh, for this. But you wonder if they do have some kind of technology that they they can detect these openings in the portals or whatever and suddenly get in there real quick and i often wonder if that's what the movie the mist the stephen king story was alluding to as well because the soldier actually even said we opened an interdimensional portal or something came through as if they were you know the military in the u.s does know about these things and can or at least wants to try and open them stargates could it have been that then? Could it have been an experiment perhaps that went wrong with the military and they've opened something? They knew they'd opened it. All hell broke loose. So they were up there um, in the stealth aircraft trying to get an angle on what was going on. Yeah, and, and like the first story, again, the same theory of people who should not be disturbed and frightened by it, in this case, military men. And it takes a lot to scare them are absolutely rattled by it. Apparently it was pure pandemonium, bedlam, apparently. And the strange, what I also find strange about it is 1996. I don't recall it, that being splashed across the mainstream news, do you? No, but that's the same year the stuff happened in Ireland. You would think something that big would be, you know, front page news, yet a weather balloon goes past and it's all, yeah. over, all around the world. And they back in the nineties, they would have they would have blasted it out there because it would have got firstly huge ratings for newspapers for the tabloids because what was all the rage back in the nineteen nineties? The X Files, TV shows like Sightings and Unsolved Mystery. There was a mainstream paranormal mania, especially to do with aliens back then, and that would have been a, a, you know a money a money spinner for the newspapers, but they didn't even put it out there to make the ridicule it, make fun of it. I don't recall it ever appearing on 40 and TV with Lionel Thanthorpe. I don't recall him covering that one. I don't know if it's my bad memory, but do you? No. I don't. I know, but uh, I, I know people who I could ask Lionel Thanthorpe, and we'll, I might I'll ask him to do that. But uh, no. And uh, the one that happened in Ireland is almost unknown outside Ireland as well. And it wasn't it, the Irish Times covered it. And they, and now they're sort of give now they're really covering it because you know the way the media now want everyone believing in aliens, so now they're like revisiting the case and saying this guy was right, 
Uh, but you know, at the, at the at the time, he was either a nutcase, and he was a, this guy was an astronomer. He wasn't there. Uh, he wasn't like you know. If, I, I'm not. I'm not. I hate to say this. I'm not putting down sheep farmers or anything like that. But you know, you know who they pick on and who they ignore. And usually, when it's someone who could say that they can't ridicule, they generally ignore them. And in this case, it was you know, hard nosed military people. Yeah. Very, very strange. But yeah, I'll, I'll send you the link for you to put in the description because it's a very interesting interview that it's a, a couple of hours long, but it's worth sitting down and watching. Yeah, well, Joe Rogan was genuinely convinced when he heard the story. Right. Have you got the link to that as well? No, but it's out there. You can go like it's, it's called something like the Brazilian alien experience or something like that. It's Go to his right. Joe Rogan YouTube, YouTube channel, you'll find it. Have a look for that, yeah. Mm. yeah it's got me perplexed that one definitely something to that i mean there's something to all the stories but that one um was pure pandemonium with so many witnesses a whole city well you i never heard of it until you told me about it the other day so that's how i didn't even know about it i heard about the dover demon but i didn't know about this one and yeah well, i stumbled on it with the dover demon and when i'm reading about things for the first time uh, new 40 and stuff that I've never heard of. I always have my kind of emotional feeling, noetic y thing switched on. And that story made me feel afraid. It's almost like uh, I, I, I understand why those military folks were so badly affected by it. Yeah, I understand what you mean there. You get a. Um... You get a feeling, don't you, like that the hackles on the back of your neck go up and you think, no, there's something to this. Have you ever seen a film called Ar The Arrival or Arrival with Charlie Sheehan made around then, the 90s? It's a very interesting film about a radio telescope that discovers, basically in Central America, an, an alien. He finds out about an alien and, and the military are all down there. And uh, it's kind of, they, they definitely were going for the X-File fans. It's a good film, actually. But uh, it was almost like now, when you told me about this incident, it was almost like that movie, The Arrival, was either, what's the word, psychically picking up on the story or else predictive programming. Station five. Is my voice even vaguely familiar to you, Zane? I really don't want to repeat of last week. Look, if I say I'm going to be there, I will be there. End of story. There is nothing more important to me right now than that. Zane! Zane! Searching for ETs in this political environment is a tough sell. I come to you with the possibility of extrasolar life. I can't afford it. They're acting like it never happened. It's like we never gave him any tape. First signal is definitely sky based, but this one is earth based. Something's going on here, Shar. What is it that they're trying to hide? It's a troubled young man. Why are you telling them lies about me? I want my tape back. I want it back. They branded his theory paranoid. There are some DOD guys here going through our stuff. I don't know who these guys are, but I do know that they're lying to you. And the only ones who believe <laughs> what's coming, if they're not here now, they will be soon. Who's in? Are the ones who've already arrived. Right now, as much as you think you know, you don't know the half of it. Why did they leave? They didn't. How do you know? Because we aren't dead yet. Move! Stop watching the skies. I know why they're here. Start watching the look back. Ron Silver, The Arrival. Like I said, Z, you didn't know the half of it. You know, or that the director or the writer had heard the stories of what happened in Brazil and he wrote the movie The Arrival. So it's a good film. It's definitely worth watching. What year was that? Around the same time, mid-90s. Right, this was 96, this incident. Yeah. January 96, so mm, it's possible. I do um, 
when you're going back to you saying you got the feels, you know, that there's something to this. Um, I understand that because um, when I was, it was quite late at night when I was researching this because I do a lot of the research quite late at night and some some of the stories, um, you go to bed and you, you sleep quite soundly and then there's some that you lay in bed thinking, oh, I wish I hadn't have read that this so late at night and that was one of them actually lay in bed thinking, crikey. Well, those insights always come to me as soon as I wake up in the morning. I find that what well, just before I get out of bed, I get clarity of insight regarding all of this stuff. It's like as if my subconscious mind during my slumbers is working on the prop on the problem. Or telling yeah. me you wake up in the morning and you think, Yes, that's it. That makes sense. Yeah, all my best stuff, even my jokes and funny satirical stuff, always have we should do a bit on this on, on Hocus Focus. Always happens within fifteen minutes of waking up lying in bed. Yeah, and answers to problems. Yeah, and always has. And it's right there with the tarot and the star card and the the sudden well, it's really the sun. The star card would be right before it, but the the sun has risen and you go, Okay, I can fix this. Yeah. It's amazing, isn't it? it doesn't get talked about. So that it. is the story of the Vahinia devil or extraterrestrial and we'd love to hear your thoughts on what you think this might be or maybe you caught something on mainstream news regarding that story around the time that it happened we certainly didn't on this side of the pond so please any information you've got um maybe you know some people who lived in the city at the time or who live there now and had relatives that that saw something just put it in the comments for us to have a look because it's very very interesting and now we have the glory of Vanderbilt of navigating the void, uh, the fashionista of the 40th, and it's Sarah with the Psychic Hygiene. This week, I bumped into someone I haven't seen for at least a year. And after a few polite words of how you doing, the person started off on a gossip fest, telling me some very personal things that were none of my business about their private life and also about other people that I don't know. I managed to break free from the conversation and afterwards I was a bit annoyed that they thought it was okay to overshare and gossip like that, not least because firstly it reiterated why I had avoided them in the first place. And secondly, they have no boundaries and never will. And thirdly, if they're gossiping and oversharing like that, you can guarantee it's an attempted trade-off to get personal information from you in order to fuel their future gossiping with the next person they bump into. So a good psychic hygiene tip for staying out of gossip is to be mindful of what you say and who you say it to. Before sharing information about someone else, ask yourself, is it necessary or even relevant to the conversation? If it's not, then refrain from sharing it. If someone tries to engage you in gossip, politely decline to participate and change the subject. It's important to recognise that participating in gossip can be energetically draining and can create a negative karma. If you find yourself getting caught up in gossip, just take a moment to stop and reflect on the energy you're putting out into the world and ask yourself, is this really how you want to spend your time and energy? And if you don't want to spend time gossiping, then come away from it. Most of the gossip and tales you hear from other people are coming from a very one-sided perspective anyway. And ask yourself, how would you feel if you were the one being gossiped about? Because you can guarantee that if they're talking like that to you, they'll not think twice about gossiping about you in the same way to somebody else. So remember, spreading rumours or talking negatively about others can create negative energy and it can also be a form of psychic attack, not only on the person being talked about, but also on yourself. So focus on positive, uplifting conversations that promote harmony and positivity. And that's my psychic hygiene tip for this week.
as John Lydon sang in the song Public Image Limited, two sides to every story. And uh, yes, this is uh, when you spread rumors like this, you know, we all do it now and again, and we might do it to protect a friend or something, but the ones who do it all the time, they're black magicians. They may not think they are, not even believe in it, but that's what they are. And this is why so many tabloid journalists end up alcoholics or drug addicts and die of cancers in early ages. You look at the, the death roll of tabloid journalists or sensational journalists, they all seem to die young and always have things like cancer. That is the damage they're doing to themselves by spreading gossip and innuendo to a wide audience. And how many years have I been saying if they're talking shit about you, someone else, they're talking shit about you. If anyone sends me a private message talking shit about someone else in the alt scene, I immediately block them. Uh, because it, it it's just, uh, I don't want people like that around me. They're poison, and they're, 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 they'll do the same to you in a second. So, yeah, I mean, uh, the, it's amazing when you meet these people that you don't have anything to do with them, and then within five minutes, it dawns on you why you, don't want to, why you didn't have anything to do with them. Look, this, I, as I always say, Sarah, and I know you agree with me, there's two kinds of people in this world and no one else. One, that you're, you're actually feeling your life has been improved by their presence in it, and the other, you feel like your life is being damaged by their presence in it. And that's it. It's as simple as that. Yeah, I'm. Yeah, I'm talking. If you're talking between friends and family, and you're warning somebody, or you know, you're protecting somebody, that's a different matter. But I'm talking about the people that yeah. are telling you things that they shouldn't be telling you, and going oversharing, and they're oversharing because they want you to feel obliged to do the same, yes. so they can come away with information about you. That that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. Yeah. And those kinds of people often issue the two most evil sentences possible. And they're both black magic sentences. They're both black magic incant incantations. No smoke without fire, which is really evil when you think about it. It's, it only ever comes out in court and proven, can you actually say that? And the second one, and for the greater good. Two pure black magic phrases, no smoke without fire, and for the greater good. Wickedness is often justified, and I put justified in quotations with those two, by, by people who are very fond of issuing those two statements. Near the village of Ilton in North Yorkshire is a remarkable structure known as the Druid's Temple. While this is not an original megalithic structure going back to Celtic or pre-Celtic times, the location itself still contains an indescribable energy suggesting that this structure was to be designed as something more than just a curiosity for the landed gentry. Nestled in a deep woodland, it contains within its mass something of a mystery. At one level, the arrangement of stones is far too formal and complex compared to a genuine mega stone structure you might find all around the UK and Ireland. Yes, it's a pastiche and most certainly a homage to buried sites, in particular Stonehenge, but on a smaller scale. Even though the construction was obviously a difficult and impressive piece of engineering perhaps comparable to that of Coral Castle in Florida yet this one located in the wet and windy North Yorkshire landscape the Druid's Temple was supposedly built over 200 years ago by an individual by the name of William Downby 
apparently it was during a time of economic downturn and high unemployment and the story is that Danby hired local men to construct this homage to Stonehenge all working for a full shilling a day this is probably true because during this period again all over the UK and Ireland the landed gentry often had follies built upon their land just to keep the local tradespeople and workmen in employment there are lots of rumors surrounding the Druids temple one of them is that William Danby actually recruited a hermit to live as a silent druid on a seven year contract inside the actual folly although the details of this are sketchy and inconsistent one thing that definitely does seem plausible is that with the growth of Freemasonic druidry which happened in the early 1800s it's entirely plausible that the Druid's temple at Ilton was used for these Masonic quote-unquote Druidic events mock rituals and so on although one does have to wonder about the sacrificial table near the grotto at the back of the monument there is no doubting there is a genuine beauty about this structure and it seems perfectly compatible in many ways with genuine megaliths from the Neolithic and Bronze Age but at the same time it doesn't and perhaps that's the appeal not only is the structure slightly too much to be plausible but so is the energy contained within it this is Thomas Sheridan reporting for Hocus Focus in Ilton, Yorkshire, England. This week, is the psychic weather going to rain on our parade or bring some sunshine into our lives? It's time to find out as we welcome Thomas with this week's Psychic Weather. This week's Psychic Weather ties on with Sarah's psychic hygiene report. Tips is black magic. Black magic is afoot right now. Now, there are certain elements or certain periods where black magic, a black magic envelope kind of develops and people who are either passively or actively involved in casting black magic hexes either through the gossip that Sarah was talking about, or genuine magical hexes, find it easier to get us and get all of us. And this is usually indicative of a wickedness in the world working at the higher level behind the scenes. I remember before 9-11, there was a very long period of this. This one is not in the same league, so I don't think another 9-11 is coming. But that, that it usually, when the powers that be are involved in their darkest wickedness. One of the reasons you can tell is that the black magicians start having great success. How do you know if you're being hexed right now? If suddenly everyone, including the, and, and, and it can include the pets in the household, are feeling very ill. Now, may, and someone may not be directly targeting you per se, but someone who might not like you and hate you as a resentfulness against you, that will be manifested in that way. You'll buy milk from the supermarket that might have a week to go on the end by date and it will sour. A sour milk in your home with no explanation out of the blue is always a sign of black magic. Always, unless your fridge is broken or something like that. But if it's in the fridge and you've got a week to go or a couple of days to go before the sell by date, 
which really means a couple of weeks, really. And uh, that's that's the, and this, the milk goes sour for no apparent reason. You're being hexed. And things like that. Anything, things don't work. Uh, nosebleeds that come out of nowhere. Uh, difficulty sleeping. I mean, extreme difficulty sleeping. Alcohol affecting you very badly, like one drink making you feel rotten. Uh, heart palpitations. That's it. It's it's definitely and it's not just me. I know other people are now are now experiencing it right now. The psychic defense that's afforded to us by the natural world has been reduced because of the monsters behind the scenes have affected reality in some dark way, and it's happening to all of us now. And people who even had resentful, who were even resentful of you, and uh, it'll it it will happen. Also, if you believe there's an individual in your life who has an entity connected to them, you will often be bumping into them more than you should. You'll turn a corner and they're there. You, they shouldn't be in a street that they should be on and they bump into them. And that happens. Defense against black magic hexes. Well, the classic is keep lots of salt around your house. Put mirrors on your windowsills pointing upwards. Uh, be once you're aware of this is going on, it stops a lot of the time. We're usually most vulnerable when we're ignorant of what's happening. That's the psychic weather this week. Black magic is on the march, and we're going to find out soon why. But until then, implement. Uh, also, cleaning can help a lot, and also uh, things like burning incense around your heads is fantastic for that as well. But if you're having unexplained illnesses in the household, milk turning sour. Always use milk as a fantastic substance for uh, the detection of black magic. It's almost like the holy water in Salem's not turning blue. Milk suddenly go and the dairy products th and things that uh, dairy products that lose their their structure, like cheeses that melt for no reason, that dissolve for no reason. This is this is classic folk magic now. Or if you have sour cream to put on your tacos and the sour cream isn't like whipped cream, it turns to like liquid white. There's something about, this is why our ancestors venerated cows in the bovine world because there was, mag there was a magical element to to, uh, to vaca. Uh, the, there's a whole thing on that, uh, vaca mansui, uh, using milk as a form of uh, divination. So there you go, black magic is afoot. There's the science. Lots of not organic sea salt, dead sea salt, the best from Israel for protection. Mirrors on the window, if you have little small mirrors, uh, lying on the windowsills pointing upwards. If you have a fireplace, don't leave it unattended. Either block it up or keep the fire going all the time, and uh, you'll be fine. You're already 80% protected by just knowing about it. The other 20% is to totally eradicate it and send it back is what I just mentioned. And that's the psychic and a very serious psychic weather this report this week. And our third story tonight is one that genuinely frightened me when I read the book about it as a young kid. It traumatized me, in fact. There was a book, fantastic bookshop, second-hand bookshop near where I lived. There was chains of them all around Dublin called the Bam Bam. And I built my first 40 in my and I still got loads of them from that shop. They sold second-hand paperbacks. And he picked a body, Dennis Wheatley, books for pennies, pocket change, and all lots of magic books, all those 70s books on the cult and magic. And one of them was a book written by a person called John Fuller, and it discussed the case of the ghosts of Flight 401. Now, Flight 401 was an Eastern Airline flight from JFK in New York uh, to Miami. It was a Lockheed TriStar and it was flown by experienced pilots. While it was making its approach to Miami airport, it crashed into the Florida Everglades. It made a sudden descent and crashed into the Florida Everglades. 
three of the four cop crew, cop pit crew were killed, two flight attendants, 163 or so passengers, and about 75 passengers survived. It was a miracle anyone survived. Uh, this was the was also people who were probably eaten by alligators in this in the Everglades as well, who probably survived the crash. It was a horror. It was discovered that the track no one could understand why a brand new plane, the Lockheed TriStar, which all the pilots and engineers spoke very highly of, suddenly just made a rapid descent and crashed into the Everglades with, with an experienced crew on board. The the reason for it when the flight recorder, the black box recorder was examined, was something incredibly stupid and incredibly tragic. A light that indicated if the landing gear was up or down, that the nose landing gear was down, was broken. The little light bulb, a 25 cents light bulb in the indicator. So... When the light didn't come on, it was standard procedure for one of the flight engineers to go into a place called the galley and see if the cock, the wheels were up or down. But physically, look, they could see. So one of the flight engineers climbed down into below the aircraft. This is a wide-body commercial airliner. And re phoned them back up into the cockpit. And they said that the... The gear is the front note, the landing gear is down, everything's okay. It's just the light bulb in the control panel is gone. Then something unbelievable happened. The crew in the cockpit started searching for a light bulb, a spare light bulb, to replace when they were just about to approach. And the three of them became preoccupied with finding this 25 cent light bulb until the last words on the tape on the flight recorder was something's not right here they'd suddenly lost altitude what had happened was they were as they were looking for the light bulb the plane went down they weren't watching the the, the altimeter and crashed into the everglades a horrible horrible avoidable tragedy that happened anyway after the flight and crash investigation was done and the court cases and so on were all heard. It was common practice, and still is, by the way, for parts that had not been catastrophically damaged inside a, from a crash to be reused to, as spare parts for other, not just the Lockheed TriStar, but other standardized things like overhead compartment lockers and things like that. So a few months later, after the investigation was over, a, a service technicians at Eastern started installing the parts from Flight 401 into other planes, overhead lockers, and also, you know, technical parts like equipment, bits of machinery, all kinds of things. Suddenly, all over Eastern Airlines, flight crews, Flight attendants and passengers reported seeing the ghosts of the pe the pot of the, the the cockpit crew who were killed when Flight Four Hundred One crashed into the Everglades. Some of these were ranged from walking down or taking the elevator down to the gallery, and the flight engineer seeing the flight on Flight Four Hundred One, but the captain seeing the captain who. Uh, be standing there. His name was Robert Loft, and the other, the other two officers who were killed. One of the most frightening ones was when a flight attendant opened an overhead locker, and there was the disembodied head of the captain Robert Loft looking at her. A memo was sent out to all Eastern employees that they would be immediately dismissed, without back pay or any benefits or redundancy pay if they mentioned or were gossiping about the ghosts of Flight 401. After Eastern had an inventory of all the planes who'd received 401 spares, they quickly removed them and replaced them with new spares bought directly from Lockheed, and the ghosts, happened, the ghosts stopped happening. 
the amount of people who saw these ghosts was in the thousands. All of flights all over the US and other international flights. It was basically assumed that these were the tormented souls of the pilots who had felt deeply responsible for this crash and were trying to repent at some level for their guilt of causing all these deaths over looking for a broken light bulb. But the book is so well written. It's such a frightening book. I found as a child, it, it's basically undebunkable. And although all kinds of things have been made to debunk it, you, you just can't. There's too many witnesses. There's also, they also said it was rumors and lies made up by unions in, in uh, Eastern to, uh, you know, stop using spare parts because this kind of nonsense. It was all slander. Anyone who talked about it would have been fired. And uh, it led to numerous laws, lawsuits and so on. Which shows you that was probably true. Uh, what can you say to this one? It's just a terribly sad story, but also terribly kind of frightening and tragic as well. And what do you think about that one, Sarah? Sarah? Oh, oh sorry, sorry. Before I say that, it was made into an awful TV movie with Ernest Borgnine, which really wasn't very good. If you're thinking of seeing the TV movie about it, it's not very good. So, what do you think of that, Sarah? Well, we, we've talked about before in previous episodes about negative energy brought about by traumatic events such as train crashes and plane crashes. Um, we, and the psychic energy that generates from that explodes into the atmosphere and causes the atmosphere to record it like a video recording or a photocopier. And then the event plays over and over and over and very often at the same time in the same place. Um, and they say that the ghosts we see in that type of haunting are unaware of the surroundings. And it's not the same as a haunting with an active ghost because there's no interaction between it and you. But having said that, with this incident, it may be an actual active haunting because there's interaction between the deceased crew and the living passengers, um, due to the nature of some of the hauntings that have been reported, and there's been quite a few, I read quite a few stories. Um, that one that you said about the dismembered head appearing in the overhead lockers, and another story, the vice president of Eastern Air um, boarded a flight from New York, and he was actually talking with a pilot on board who he assumed was in charge, and later he recognised that the pilot he'd been speaking to was, in fact, uh, Robert. And it wasn't the first or the last time that this deceased pilot had been spotted after his death. And um, another incident, a, a captain on one of the flights was asked to check on a passenger in first class who was in a pilot's uniform. And the senior flight attendant of that flight said that this pilot seemed a bit dazed and unresponsive when they tried to speak to him and ask if he was all right. And he wasn't on the passenger list. And then the captain recognised him as being Robert, again, the, the dead pilot. Um, and there was another incident, a flight attendant on a flight from New York to Miami, which was the same route as the December 72 crash. And that's the story you said about the overhead locker. She opened it to see Bob's face looking at her. Um, and the other pilot, Don, he was called Don. His face was above the oven door where they, they reheat all the meals. And she called two fellow crew members to witness what she'd just seen. And apparently this spectre of one of the, the pilots called Don reportedly said, watch out for a fire in this plane. And on the returning flight, an engine failed and had to be shut down because it caught on fire. So there's been lots of um, reports of these two pilots finding problems that could have created another crash. Donald Repo was that second in command, the second uh, flight officer. And he always seemed to appear in the galley of the ovens and the fridges and all the stuff at the back of the plane. 
And that's where the most salvage happened from because that was the last part of the plane that crashed into the swamp. So a lot of the the kitchen equipment was salvageable and that went into many planes. So when an oven broke down in one plane, they got the 401 oven and so on, that kind of thing in the fridge. A loft, uh, Robert Loft often appeared in the elevator. There was two types of excess. One was an elevator and one was like an industrial elevator and the other was a, a spiral staircase. And apparently, he, the, when he first started communicating, it was to flight engineers going into on the elevator uh, because the paneling on the flight 401 of the elevator had been salvaged and put into other four other planes. So he commonly communicated with that. This was the thing that upset me the most and frightened me the most as a kid. That, yeah, we talk about the psychometric aspects that the trauma blasted them the molecular structure of the objects, and therefore they appear as passive ghosts. But these were communicative, you know, active ghosts who were seem to be wanting to atone for the horrific accident that they caused through their negligence before or what? See, it certainly seems that way. Another pilot heard loud knocks from underneath the floor beneath him, and when he opened the trap door in the cockpit, he saw um, the pilot called Don looking at him and then he disappeared. So he wanted to look further and he found a problem looking in the trap door that could have caused a serious accident if it hadn't been spotted before takeoff. Yes, the flight itself, the initial crash shocked the world because the TriStar was considered the safest jet that Lockheed had ever made. And everyone who flew it loved it. It said it had, and it had all the latest safety, safety, uh, you know, technical facilities. It was, you know, so this was a great shock on many levels. And the book, The Ghost of Flight 401 by John Fuller, I definitely recommend that if you want to read a really good 40 book on ghosts in, in the modern world, I definitely recommend that book. It is a page turner. What's it called again? Sorry. The Ghosts of Flight 401 by John Fuller. I've seen them on eBay for 25 cents and things like that, so they're easy to find plenty of them around. Do you know if there was any um, premonitions of this happening? Was was anything anything unusual in the weeks yes, and months? Uh, not to Robert Loft's wife was had a feeling that something was going to happen. And when the Eastern Airline uh, detective knocked on her door she knew exactly what had happened he was not supposed to be on that flight and uh, also the flight engineer who survived whose name i can't remember his wife also literally begged him not to take that flight there there was lots of things like that there was a couple who was going on holiday their first holiday in years and the wife survived and the, the husband didn't, and she was saying, we shouldn't be on this flight, we shouldn't be on this flight. And when the, it was announced that, well, people were waiting at the gate to meet their relatives and friends in Miami, the, the Eastern reps came over and said, we have terrible news, uh, the Flight 401 is down in the Everglades. And some people were shouting, I knew it, I knew it, I knew this was going to happen. So there you go. Right. That's interesting. Very interesting. I'm wondering if when they removed the parts of the plane from other planes, <clears throat> if by doing that, that symbolically released them from whatever had trapped them and made them, I can't really say earthbound because they weren't of the earth. It, it all took place in the air, really, but that trapped them from here to yeah, maybe like going on. I, was, I would call them etheric prisoners of conscience. Mm. Something like that. Yeah, they and I believe they destroyed the parts. They actually sent them to a, a scrapyard and had them destroyed. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah, that might have symbolically released them from the but, um, guilt. Yeah, but then the Eastern Airline were bastards as well. They were openly encouraging the wife of Robert Loft and other crew members, wives and families to sue Fuller writing the book there was an an enormous pr campaign to shut the thing down 
And the person who kept the story alive was, believe it or not, Dan Aykroyd, the actor from Ghostbusters, who's a big time Fortean. And he making appearances on the Johnny Carson show and the Merv Griffin show in America in the late 70s. Uh, they used to ask him, so you're interested in spooky stuff and aliens? And he says, yes. And they'd ask him, like, well, what's the most? And he'd always bring up Flight 401. So the story would have been probably buried in lawsuits and everything else had not Dan Aykroyd, who was actually a hero of this, went on to the biggest talk shows on American TV and made sure everyone remembered the story and didn't and were aware of him. That's really yeah, that's interesting because he, he he is a big Fortean and he's he's big into the occult as well. And he used to, I don't know if he still does, but he owned a, an occult shop and it was the shop that was featured in the movie Ghostbusters. That was actually his shop and his business. I've contacted him a few times for an interview. And he's hard to get. You have to go through agents and they would dismiss me because I'm not like famous or stuff, anything like that for BR313. But I, I would love to talk to him. Any time I've ever seen him on any show, he always brings it up. I remember the last time I saw him, he was on Richard and Judy on, in England on ITV, I think, whatever that channel was on. And he had mentioned that he just got back from Israel where he'd heard there was a, a, a time slip thing that happened where people were in Tel Aviv in a part of the city and suddenly found themselves living in the Middle Ages. Like the stories you get have been in, uh, in Liverpool a lot, the time shift things. And suddenly they were in Tel Aviv in the Middle Ages and they saw people dressed as knights and crusaders walking around them for a few minutes and then it vanished. And it was actually covered like a main a headline story on, on Israeli television. Wow. You've had no response back from... Well, I wrote to, you know, yeah, I, can't, I, I, I sent two emails to, to his agent in the management company. Nothing. So, but um, if I, I, it's the kind of thing if I met him, if I got him directly. So, but that's a, that's, that's, that's one person I would absolutely love to get on a show. And it's ironically, he was in, Go he was in Ghostbusters. <laughs> Yeah, I think the shop in the in the film is called Raise Occult Books, um, and he does he does have his own occult shop. Yeah, he's very him and Nicholas Cage. I think he's also very very big into that as well. Yeah, a lot of Hollywood people are a lot a lot of, a lot of like going back to Shirley MacLaine and but beyond that, a lot of them were connect. You know, Martin, what's her name? Uh, Jane Mansfield was very much interested. I believe in Lovecraft. She was another one like Marilyn Monroe was a much more smarter woman than she was made out to be. I suppose with the uh with the aircraft, the airline rather, um they were kind of in a difficult position because you know they were a business and they were trying to balance the safety and comfort of the passengers with the reputation and success of the airline and they might have thought that acknowledging the hauntings could damage the business, but then denying it could cause even more harm if people believed that that's the airline they, was covering up the truth. That's why they shut it down, because uh, flight attendants were immediately resigning, because it was nearly all women back then who were flight attendants. And they were, and, and that was a very well-paid job. That was, a good, that was a great job back then for a, a, a girl in their 20s and 20, 30s to do. Some they paid excellent money, and it was a you know it was a glamorous job back then, and they were quitting, and they were they were having problem getting recruitment, because who wants to be on a ghost plane? Yeah, I wouldn't fancy seeing a ghost at thirty five thousand feet, would you? Especially a disembodied head inside an oven or an overhead locker. No. To me. Uh, some of the stories are kind of funny, like the one of the guys in the floor, that he told them to check for a fire. I would check along the, the 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 lines. the The guy who relayed that story was almost like, "Oh, look, it's Bob Loft's ghost." Okay, let me check. It had gotten to the point where you almost get the feeling that engineers on the crews, on the planes, and were actually kind of like glad to see the ghost because it actually <laughs> they were actually helping them, which I find yeah. that really fascinating. Yeah, maybe they saved so many. Because they did, they did stop some bad things happening to the flights over the course of the sightings, and maybe that saved enough people, um, enough lives 
for them to be able to be released and go on to wherever they needed to go? At least trying to atone at some level. Maybe the planes were never going to crash, but they, any any possibility. And it probably would have been also compassion for the pilot, the, the freight crews, because they'd know that many of those guys who fly those planes would be good men who do, you know, care. And they wouldn't want to see them be kind of tarnished with the same reputation, post-mortal reputation that they that, that the 401 crew got. It is, a, it is a tragedy when you think about it. It was just a faulty light bulb that they were fixated on. It's it, there's, a, there's a lot of spookiness about, about uh, airline crashes. Like you covered the 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 American Air Force one up in the mountains on last week's uh, report, the there's lots of stuff around Lockerbie, but yet yeah, not enough to make a cohesive forty and story. But there are stories of I you know people living on islands in the west coast of Ireland said that they saw strange colored lights raining from the sky where they lived into the ocean at the moment Lockerbie happened over in Scotland. They weren't looking towards Scotland, not Scotland, but the people who lived on, they, they said they seen these strange lights raining from the sky at the moment that that, that the Pan Am flight went down on Lockerbie. And um, I was in Lockerbie not too long ago and there's a dark energy all over that place around there. And uh, I know people who've lived in Lockerbie and remember it when it happened, or nearby, and remember when that happened. I bet if somebody, and it's a difficult one to dig into because it was such a horror story, but I think there's a there's a, there's some fourteen stuff ready to be made public or to be bet, to be found out for anyone who's interested in going to Lockerbie and finding out. Yeah, I remember that story. I remember that happening myself. It was uh, just la on my last year at school, and um, that was pretty. Was it? I think was it Christmas? Was it Christmas time? I seem to remember it was a, a quite a poignant time. It was quite a one of those. It was amplified by the time of year. Was it Christmas or Halloween or something? Christmas. Christmas. So that <laughs> gives it an amplification there, doesn't it? Yeah, I was living in New York and working as a, I was still I was like with twenty one. And I was working as a house painter or something like that, just painting. And I heard about it, and I was like, went home that night. I had to switch off the news. It was making me so upset. Yeah, it's very last place you would expect. Well, people talk about the noise of the thing coming to earth, and uh, there's some documentaries online of people whose stuff, you know, pa the passengers ended up on their farm in fields and stuff, and. The stories they tell you, the guy who was saying, my son can't even talk about on, com on camera. He, he just can't deal with what he saw all those years ago. Yeah. Puts me in mind of the Aberfan disaster, another sleepy village where you wouldn't expect that kind of um, trauma or um, tragedy, rather, to, to yeah. happen in such a small town. Yeah, and, and, and Dunblane is not far from Lockerbie, and that's another horror thing, you know. So, um, yeah, I mean, the fl I believe the Flight 401 story. I don't care about the lawsuits, and I don't care about the the other stuff. I completely believe the story, and the book is definitely, yeah, it's well, it frightened me when I was 12, you know, but I mean, now I don't know. What, it, 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 I don't know. What, it wouldn't, but it's, it's definitely, I can remember it was, I was like going through the, I was going through, like I read it, I was reading on the bus going home and I was finished the next day, you know, I kind of think, couldn't stop it. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. yeah there is, there is um, an, a, an extra element of spookiness to um, hauntings or things that involve tra modes of transport, because ghost trains. and The psychic energy of the traveling is a, is a different, you know, when you're traveling, the psychic energy is different. It's different, you know. I mean, you can actually use it in magic uh, on planes taking off and landing to charge a talisman uh, by capturing the psychic energy of that all around you. But, uh, yeah, and then you couple that with something like 401. Well, then you've got like a paranormal 40 and, you know, extravaganza, the only way I could put it. Spectac spectacular. 
Yeah, there's something. Yeah, there's something quite creepy about planes that go down, especially oh. ones that disappear as well. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it's so rare. It rarely happens. I'm not afraid of flying or anything like that because the chances of it happening are billions to one, practically. But uh, the, when you hear about the, the the stupidity of life, four one went down. You just, I mean, you just can't believe it. I'm looking for a light bulb. Yeah, and that's what they recorded on the on the box. Is it? That's what they heard. Yeah, literally the last things they're like, you know, look on, look what. No, there's a cabinet over there. Have a look there. Yeah. No, no. Well, I, I, I'm sure I saw one down here earlier on, and then something's not right with our altitude. That off. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Just took the took the right of the ball for a, a moment, and that. Yeah, and the, the, the Florida Everglades, especially back then, were completely black. There was nobody out there except alligator hunters, uh, at you know out hunting alligators. Uh, but there was nothing else, so they they wouldn't have seen street lights or anything because it was such a a remote, uninhabited, you know, place. In fact, that the the the, no, all no, so. the alligator hunters saved loads of lives. Apparently, in Florida, you hunt alligators at night, uh, and for they eat them, you know, like uh, for skins and stuff. And apparently, uh, they have these kind of like jet foils. They're like a big fan fly across the Evergate swamps and apparently they save dozens of lives by picking up people and getting them immediately to the to the the ambulances and the paramedics who couldn't get into the swamp so there was like a heroic aspect to it as well you can almost understand the angst that those deceased the souls of those pilots must have felt if they're grappling if the last thing they were doing was grappling around for a um a light bulb. Oh yeah. To realize what the consequence of that was, I do understand. I can understand how how they felt, how they felt so bad. Well, it shows you that the intensity of human emotion and it can trans transcend that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so if you have any more stories about four hundred one or theories or anything like that. Well, you know what to say. Uh, I I highly recommend the book by. But uh, John Fuller, and uh, if anyone knows that, Dan Aykroyd, tell him I'm here. And now the part of the show where we present our show and tell of books that we have been inspired by and treasure as part of our personal 14 libraries. And my one this week, it's a, well, just to show I'm not a bimbo, it's an intellectual one. It's called Religion and the Decline of Ma Magic by Keith Thomas. Now, this is Stop a, right there. You won't believe this. Now, you can leave this in or whatever, but I was going to review that today and something ah. stopped me. Something stopped me. I, I even wrote the review. I read it back and I thought, mm, I don't know about maybe another week. Put it back and I put it back. <laughs> well, I've got another one to say. I forgot to pick a book before the show happened. And I have a bookshelf over there with about 300 books on it. And I I just was, ran over and pulled this one out. I have, I, a, put... I have a section of my ones that I all constantly refer back to. And this was in it. How's that for a synchronicity? Look at that, viewers. Look at that. <laughs> See if we're not, it, it, there's your proof that we're hocus focused all around here. But yep. it, that, now that's magic. Yep, and it's a book about magic. Well, anyway, Keith Thomas's book on, and you know, it's not a, a, a very popular book. It's a, one you have to go look for on uh, the decline of religion and the decline of magic. Is what it says on the tin. It's about how really religion. And, and not just through darkness and witch hunts and everything, but through the success of religion, should we say, in the Middle Ages, reduced the importance of magic in people's lives to the point where they were getting what they they were getting in the in the churches what they used to get from the witches and from so, the satyrs and so on. So the book is yeah, there is mention of that dark stuff too, like you know 
which is in heretics being picked on. But a lot of it, it talks about that there is basically a, a break in agricultural lives and city lives where they moved away and more into religion. It covers alchemy, of course, and the decline of alchemy, but also it shows you how religion was really the link between the old magic world of sorcery and magic and the scientific method of the and the scientific of the Protestant Reformation, that this is what ended what they call magic superstition, idolatries and necromancies and created a situation where the Protestant Revolution and the scientific method was supposed to come in. It's an intellectual read. It's, uh, I'll be honest with you, I haven't read it all cover to cover. I've read bits of it. The main reason that I use it and love it is it's got a fantastic index and it's fabulous for research. So it is an absolute... So we want to find out about Martin Luther and which witches and you're, you're searching something else like a show like this or a book you're working on. and all Because it's, it's an academic text, really, and they're often not incredibly readable. And this one is actually... To be fair, this is not one that is not readable. It is readable. Uh, Keith Thomas did a good job. And the uh, God, God, God help that editor because this thing is enormous. And <laughs> look at the size of the font. You know, but again, its value is... It's one of these books, you know, it's like, it, this, is one, this is one of my sitting on the bog books. I'll go to the toilet, open a random page, and go, wow, that's, that's great. So there you go. Not only do we cover books on magic, but we make magic happen on Hocus Focus. Religion and the Decline of Magic by Keith Thomas. This may mean that Dan Aykroyd is on the way. The, the, that's the the reason I didn't I put it well I know the reason I put it back now it wasn't meant to be um but I just I'm like you I haven't read it cover to cover I pick it up and use it as a reference book so I didn't think I'd be able to do it any justice so but something did say put it back Sarah so I did and now I know why well so, even though even though I've never read it cover to cover we probably looked at this more than many other books because where we're constantly referring to it. And like I said, I'm, I'm, I always bring it to the toilet to have a read. So in that, in terms of actual attention. My book this week is The Haunting of Bawley Rectory by Sean O'Connor. And we discussed The um, Haunting of Bawley Rectory some months back uh, early on in the early days of Hocus Focus. And the, the book takes you through the history of Bawley Rectory in Essex, England, um, that became the focus of intense media attention in the 1920s onwards due to reports of strange happenings at the local rectory. And he details many sightings of ghosts and apparitions and other supernatural phenomena that were reported by the various occupants of the rectory, as well as all the efforts of the paranormal investigators to uncover the truth behind the haunting. And again, as with most books of this caliber, he uses a lot of witness accounts, newspaper articles and various historical documents to paint a picture of the events that took place. And he provides quite a balanced analysis, really, of the various theories that have been put forward to explain what's been going on there, including things like fraud, mental illness and genuine supernatural activity. After reading the book, I found that at the heart of the Bawley Rectory haunting, there is a sense of unresolved trauma because the rectory was built on a site of an old monastery which was destroyed during the dissolution of the monasteries in the 16th century. And this history of destruction and displacement creates a sense of unrest which might have contributed to the paranormal activity at the rectory. And the book also details the tragic history of the rectory's inhabitants, including the death of a former rector and the death of a young girl. And these events may have left the psychic imprint on the location, which continues to resonate throughout all time, really. And the Bawley Rectory haunting can be seen as a manifestation of anxieties and fears of the early 20th century. The time period was marked by political upheaval and a growing sense of 
dis disillusionment with traditional religious and values. So the paranormal activity at Bali Rectory can be seen as a response to these societal changes that were going on. Yeah, I'm going to get my hands on that one myself. I've been looking for a Borley book, and that sounds just what the doctor ordered. Before we go tonight, and Sarah does the Tarot of the Week, again, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for uh, being fantastic to us and uh, saying lovely things about the work, and we're delighted about that. And uh, just to finish up quickly, uh, the psychic weather report is very serious, so just to look after yourselves. Don't be terrified. It's avoidable. And, uh, yeah, thanks very much for that. Yeah, we hope you've enjoyed tonight's journey into the unexplained and that you'll join us again next week. And thank you for letting us be a part of your Sunday night. And next week, we're back over on my channel. So please subscribe to both channels so you don't miss an episode. And please continue to share the show far and wide because you guys are our only form of advertising and we appreciate every view and every share that you invest in us. You keep watching and we'll keep bringing you more episodes. We can't say fairer than that. And this week, the Tarot of the Week, and I'm really happy with this card, especially after the sidekick weather. I think we need this is the Six of Cups. And the card depicts a young boy and a girl standing in front of a large stone building. They're both smiling, <clears throat> and the boy is handing the girl a cup filled with, white with a white flower, which symbolises purity and innocence. He bends over and presents the girl with this cup and its flower with such a display of love and affection, which is what this suit of cups represents. There are five other cups in the cards, all with white flowers, and the area around them is filled with lush greenery, suggesting the great growth that can come from purity and innocence of childhood. This is the only tarot card with flowers in the cups and reveals both, and reveals both the blooming affection between the two children as well as the spiritual growth of you. There's also an adult walking back to the house as if he's checked the children are safe and he's now allowing them to be children through play while he goes and deals with the adult world. This card is perfect. It's about happy memories from your childhood or early adulthood coming to the forefront of your mind. In the Six of Cups, we see how the nostalgic romanticising of the past can be a source of strength and also an escape from reality. Six is the energy of harmony. And as the masculine and the feminine energy combine, they unite and harmonise. Six, therefore, is also the number of romance, home and family. The Six of Cups encourages you to tap into your inner child and embrace the joy, liberation and purity that comes with childhood. By allowing yourself to be carefree, imaginative and unplanned, you strengthen your connection with your genuine self and intuitive side. The card also suggests you may be revisiting your past, reconnecting with old friends or family members or returning to a place that holds nostalgic memories for you. This card can indicate a sense of sentimental longing for simpler times, and I think we're all feeling that right now. It can also bring about a desire to recapture the joy and innocence of youth. On a deeper level, the card can also represent the need to heal old emotional wounds and release negative patterns that may have developed in childhood. By revisiting and confronting these issues, you can move forward towards a more authentic and fulfilling life. Overall, the Six of Cups encourages you to embrace your inner child, connect with your past and let go of any emotional baggage that may be holding you back. Oh, thank you for that, Sarah. I needed to hear that. That's a, a lovely card. It, it's just full of sweetness and it's all about good things to and from you and us, all of us. And uh, it's a great card for people moving a house, building a new home is setting off on something like that, something domestic -y. That's a new beginning. And uh, yeah, there's not there's nothing negative in that card, really. It's one of the few ones that is absolutely directed. No, you can't read it both ways. 
And uh, even if you if, if you were to see it in a reverse, it would just be don't get too airy fairy would probably be the, and that's not even a major warning. So thank you for that, Sarah, and thanks everybody again. And we'll see you next time on Hocus Focus, which will be on Sarah's channel. Good night. See you next week. Look after yourselves. Seriously, look after yourselves. Jack Parsons got me on the moon. Jack Parsons got me on the moon.